Welcome everyone. Now, I'd like you all to picture yourself as a newly graduated geoscientist arriving in Canberra. And no, I'm not talking about our amazing uh, graduates that we have this year. Let's take it back further in time to the late 1920s. And you were fortunate enough to be a part of the newly established geological branch of the federal government. Whether you were the head honcho, Walter Woolnuff, or Commonwealth paleontologist, Frederick Chapman, or Irene Crespin, or perhaps one of the curators uh, to follow in the decades after them. Here, an opportunity arises to commence the foundations of a national geoscience collection, where specimens are utilised in cutting edge research, valued, stored, on display, and facilitate educating and inspiring new and old audiences to the fascinating world of geoscience. This is a position the first and subsequent people in the organisation would have faced, and thankfully it's resulted in the brilliant collection which we see here today. In my role, I feel a sense of responsibility, obligation and commitment to the collection and its history. So I ask the question, what would your legacy be? With this talk, I plan to take you on a journey to learn a little bit more about the National Mineral and Fossil Collection and why we have it. I'll be going into detail with regard to the collection team's achievements over the past year or two discussing just some of the different ways the collection is used by a diverse group of stakeholders. Of course, I'll be telling a story or two and how the research, education and engagement supports our mission and goals. As many of us already know, every specimen tells a story, whether it relates to its formation, what it is used for and how, or to the social history of how it ended up here. I hope to demonstrate the breadth of what we do and its importance. So bear with me if it feels like I'm jumping around a little bit. I'd like to acknowledge the Nambri and Ngunnawal people whose lands on which we, the collection resides here in the ACT. I'd also like to pay my respects to all Indigenous people and groups in Australia and overseas from whose lands the collection has been derived from and pay homage to their custodianship for the benefit of all and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples to this talk today. Our mineral collection contains about a 60-40 split between Australian and international examples, with very strong representation of the world famous Broken Hill. The majority of our fossil collection contains invertebrate species. There are approximately 3,000 holotypes in there, which are defined as being the first of that species ever described. So very important type specimens. The rock thin section slides represent a huge investment by the organisation over the decades, where slivers of rock are removed and prepared for microscopic analysis with an estimated replacement value of $10 million in today's figures. Other miscellaneous items have made their way into the collection as well over the years, not to mention the significant amounts of hard copy material. Geoscience Australia and its predecessors officially first took on the role of managing geoscience collections with its formation in 1927. It initially consisted of paleontological material, which grew and morphed into many other categories based on a variety of acquisition methods from analysis of microfossil specimens by internal experts to identify deposits of coal and oil in the 1920s and 30s, to the newly established ACT requiring geological expertise um, and the establishment of the ACT rock reference collection with R101 being the, uh, the first uh, specimen registered. A request in 1940 by the head of the organisation uh, to the Australian Museum seeking a donation of specimens was provided to establish a public museum display and expand into minerals. Specimen numbers grew as the organisation became involved in the hunt for strategic minerals around World War II, things like mica, beryl, asbestos and uranium ores, to the formation of the Bureau of, Marine, of Mineral Resources, affectionately known as the BMR, in 1946. Over these decades, specimens were collected by mineralogists, curators and paleontologists, and specimens were also submitted by internal and external researchers after being scientifically categorised. There were some significant mineral collection purchases by the organisation over the 1960s and 70s, including that of the Arthur Floss Campbell Collection in 1963. Um, the other methods of acquisition included exchanges with other organisations, museums, universities, and of course, donations and gifts over the years was through donations whereby a lot of the international specimens joined the mineral collection from private collectors who in many cases offered up very unique and significant pieces. But why does GA have a national mineral and fossil collection and why are physical collections more broadly necessary? 
Uh, every specimen is an ultimate source of original evidence, not only for the past and current investigations, but for future discoveries. Geological collections are not just the source of data on the natural world, they are the real elements of the natural world. Scientists can investigate these again and again, applying new technologies, exploring new questions and finding new answers. For example, did you know DNA sequences can now be extracted from some fossil specimens, providing evidence for understanding the relationships among and changes in populations of current and extinct species. Physical reference specimens remain necessary to facilitate scientific research and discovery. Type specimens, the standards by which species and minerals are named and identified, continue to be used by scientists to recognise, verify and classify. Other information included in collections such as digital scans of specimens, photographs and sound recordings can often be invaluable uh, as a supplement but are not sufficient without the physical specimen or object. Physical collections are not only an irreplaceable record of what the world has, in many cases they are the only record of what is now gone or inaccessible. We document this necessity under our 2028 strategy of enabling an informed Australia. Our role is to ensure geoscientific data and physical collections have enduring value are collected correctly and can be easily understood and accessed by everyone. We are the only Commonwealth organisation managing museum grade minerals, meteorites, gemstones and fossils and our section's mission has remained much the same over the years. Now I'm going to dive into what some might call the less interesting work here but that view is very open to interpretation as there is some serious fun to be had undertaking these more general collection management tasks where you get to be up close and personal with the specimens. Drooling is permitted, uh, but not on the specimens, <laughs> please. <laughs> We've hit a milestone with our collection photography and most of what you see in the presentation today is a result of that stunning imagery. Lots of work has gone into reviewing and improving metadata. Thousands of fields have been edited as a result of, review of reviewing much of the minerals. Our entire meteorite collection has been updated with the latest information from the Lunar and Planetary Research Institute. We inch higher to having coordinate coordinate information for more of the collection which will be very beneficial when we go to an online public facing database in the future. After physically reviewing every single thin section slide, we can now confirm a hard figure of 100,000 for the lot, so please no one find any more hidden under your desks. <laughs> uh, and we are nearing completion of the CPC fossils being correlated with the literature and compiled into a PDF library with direct hyperlinks. There is a lot more, some of which I'm going to elaborate on shortly. So I asked the question, these innocuous little cards associated with physical samples, often really with really fancy and difficult to read handwriting, uh, covered in dust, capturing a moment in time and, perhaps, and potentially faded over the years. Well, let me introduce specimen R3001 and its labels. In fact, five generations of labels which we now know represent over 120 years of history. The label in the middle is the handwriting of George Smith, who was the manager of the Broken Hills Consoles mine from 1890 to 1898, and an amazing mineralogist. He has described the mineral you see and dated the label, 1898, when he sent it to a civil engineer named Colonel Washington Roebling, an avid mineral collector in the US. Roebling's son donated his father's collection of 16,000 rocks and minerals to the Smithsonian in 1926 after he passed. And you can see their label on the left. The Smithsonian curator at the time described Roebling's Broken Hill material as unsurpassed in that country. Now at some stage, the Smithsonian deaccessioned the specimen and it made its way to a US collector in Utah by the name of David New, the label on the right. From there, it was acquired by Glenn Smith, a collector from Broken Hill, most likely in the 1970s, which is kind of a bit of a roundabout thing that the specimen made its way back there, um, acquired in the 1970s before being officially donated to the Commonwealth, thanks to the stellar work of the BMR Museum curator at the time, Don McCall. And this was all unraveled uh, by a chance visit to the GA collection by Paul Melville, a respected Australian mineral collector from Darwin. So this is a great example to highlight the importance of metadata, holding on to old records and preserving them. And it all came about thanks to every generation of specimen label being curated and managed. This information and story contributes and enhances the specimen, not just scientifically, uh, but also in education and outreach. 
so we can definitely learn a lot from a specimen label. Perhaps they'll be discussing the current Geoscience Australia label for this specimen in 120 years' time. I, I don't know. Although I must admit my handwriting is not up to scratch. <laughs> Our bulk fossil collection, for those that haven't seen it, certainly is a sight to see and would make um, any Indiana Jones or X-Files fans proud. It potentially houses one million unsampled fossils from the micro through to the macro scale in 11,500 drawers. The collection has been built up since the early 1900s and provides raw material to support paleontological research and GA objectives. With the need to expand on the GA rock store, which is the other half of this room, to accommodate exploring for the future and other GA laboratory samples, a cross-divisional and branch project was born that included the collections team. For the aisle which was being consolidated, the project identified fossils at the phylum or class level where possible and also it involved photographing the material. This identification will prove much more useful uh, for searching the collection both internally and externally from the users of the collection into the future. In the image on the right, uh, you can, hopefully you can see the cephalon part of the trilobite poking out and there's a bryozoan next to the bottom arrow which has been added to the catalogue now. As a result of this project, it has allowed for future growth and expansion of the rock store whilst improving the metadata of the paleontological material. As part of that, uh, the consolidation process, a number of other discoveries were made. A large number of reprints, photos, collection-specific documents, fossils from the World Heritage listed Riversley of Queensland, famous paleobotanist Mary White's F collection. We also located a number of other things like the shell collection donated by Major Bacon, some of the best purple sugi light in the world from South Africa, I hope I pronounced that right, a small meteorite, and even a colleague's glasses which were lost there over a decade ago. <laughs> I can report they have been uh, returned to their owner, although I'm not sure if the prescription, I don't think the prescription is valid anymore. <laughs> we estimate that this is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of discovering hidden specimen treasures, and long term the goal will be to replicate uh, components of this project to fulfil having imagery of every specimen and draw from each of the aisles, as well as the basic fossil descriptions. The collections team have been busy either supporting others, publishing work on the collection, or involved in publications directly ourselves over the past year and a half. Much of this is a result of loans to researchers or work done directly on the collection. As many of us know, publishing is an important formal step in validating discoveries through a robust scientific process. I might also mention that not all research uh, was undertaken on describing new specimens or on new work per se. One of the papers re-evaluated existing specimens in the collection, highlighting the importance of making old specimens available to revalidate research. These articles that were co-authored, these are articles that were co-authored, um, are available uh, for viewing on the screen, sorry, out in the foyer, um, for those that want to have a look afterwards. Um, also, too, I wanted to mention one particular article highlight in a bit more detail, and that was being a part of the Australian supplement of the famous Mineralogical Record Journal. This was an opportunity for all major Australian collections, government and private, to highlight specimens of significance to a worldwide audience. And these, the mineralogical record is literally the bling of the uh, mineral crystal world. And there is a copy available uh, there for after the talk for those here in person. And also after, the, uh, in the library, they have um, copies available for loan. One of our most important roles as managers of the National Mineral and Fossil Collection uh, is loans. Facilitating access to uh, the collection is critical in keeping not only the discovery of new science occurring but also in the education of future scientists and the general public. We have many active loans at any one time and I'd like to share a few of these with you now. Geoscience Australia has signed a letter of intent with Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre, to partner up and support each other's goals and missions, particularly around education and outreach. As part of this, the collection has naturally, of course, uh, been involved. Their recent Mars exhibition required some analogues and so we loaned about a dozen or so specimens. Gypsum was one to represent the spectacular salt deposits on Mars. Uh, the botryoidal gertite to mimic the hematite blueberries that appear on the surface and a basalt 
as an analogue of the large volcanoes such as Olympus Mons, which probably formed above mantle plumes similar to Hawaii. There was also a direct example uh, from Mars that we offered as part of the loan agreement, and that was a Martian meteorite pictured in the bottom right corner there. Our relationship with Questacon, in fact, goes back further, with a major loan of 93 specimens as part of their colour exhibition, which has been touring around the country with great success. Last year it was at the Ipswich Gallery, followed by the Newcastle Museum, and will continue on to other locations, with the loan being extended for another three years. This highlights that education isn't just about bringing people through the door, or even directing them online. Uh, partnering with other organisations like Questacon, in this case, really enhances and spreads our reach of the collection and our organisation. To educate and inspire audiences, we wouldn't necessarily have been able to, which complements our aims and missions. It also provides a different viewpoint of delivery and expertise, which wouldn't necessarily always have been considered. And hey, who doesn't want to partner with one of the best hands-on public engaging science organisations? Whilst COVID brought a halt to many things, the collection team was busy putting together a very large loan of 250 Broken Hill specimens to the National Museum of Australia as part of their Great Southern Land Gallery Development Project. This new gallery will incorporate the loan of three Broken Hill collections, the Smith, Latz and Chidley, which were donated to the Commonwealth in the 1970s and 80s. The project involved working with the NMA to narrow down the final 250 out of hundreds I can attest to that, and clean and repair them, uh, as well with their conservators. Photograph, followed by preparation and packing for transport. The Great Southern Land Gallery aims to tell the story of this unique and ancient continent, engaging visitors with bold new spaces, immersive multimedia, and more than 1,100 objects. These three specimens you see here are part of that loan. Now I'd like to move on to some examples of research or researchers undertaking activities on the collection. The first involves Honorary University of Wollongong researcher Malcolm Southwood, who I would describe as a Tsumeb fanatic. For those uninitiated, the Tsumeb mine, uh, the Tsumeb mine in Namibia was, is well known amongst geologists, mineralogists and especially mineral collectors as the mecca for some of the world's finest mineral treasures. I like to think it's akin to the Broken Hill of Africa. The geology is quite unique for this lead, copper, zinc, silver ore deposit, and it has over 240 different mineral species represented there thus far, and I'm sure more to come. Malcolm and his UAW colleague, honorary fellow Paul Carr, donated their time, knowledge and skills over two week-long visits to systematically review all our Namibian minerals, including cleaning, photographing, reclassifying incorrect mineral species or localities, and value adding significantly with much improved and detailed metadata, including the lovely mineral mineralogy descriptions uh, shown here. With 144 of the more significant pieces summarised into a PDF booklet. I've printed a copy as well, and it's available over there after the talk. Um, so you can see some of the other stunning examples represented in the collection, which we are fortunate to have. Now, let me tell you about alamosite. It is a rare secondary lead silicate mineral found in the oxidised zones of lead-bearing base metal deposits. All lead silicates, of which there are 47 so far, are a rare species that crystallise under tightly constrained conditions and therefore occur only at a few localities worldwide, including Tsumeb. This specimen was purchased in southern Africa in the late 1960s by Australian collector Clement Latz. It was donated along with his entire collection in 1976 and valued at an estimated $100,000 at the time. However, the specimen label describes it as the mineral sericite and has stayed that way ever since Latz purchased it. Now, of the hundreds of specimens that Mao came across, he knew something wasn't quite right when he saw it and after performing XRD analysis, he confirmed it was the rare alamosite. This specimen is now cited in a scientific journal, which Mao authored, and its value has gone up from about $50 as a sericite to five figures as a result of its new identity, and not to mention historic and scientific value. Both Mao and Paul are continuing to do more work on the collection. Mao, together with the GA comms team, and I are planning on an online ex exhibition to showcase GA's Sumeb minerals. 
Paul is reviewing and researching fleur appetite and associated minerals in, uh, and specimens from our Broken Hill collection. He'll be utilising several techniques, including response to ultraviolet light. For example, this specimen photographed invisible light left and shortwave UV right highlights how the inclusions were initially identified as the mineral bustamite, but the white colour in the UV light indicates that it is in fact the mineral fluorite. Dr Patrick Smith from the Australian Museum has done a significant amount of work making use of material from our bulk fossil collection as part of his PhD and ongoing research with colleagues uh, uh, looking at the Amadeus Basin. This material was collected decades ago by the organisation and demonstrates the value of preserving this kind of material. A range of animals were included in his research, trilobites, agnostids, several kinds of brachiopods, sponges, mollusks, echinoderms, plus some more obscure critters, resulting in several papers being published and generating over 500 new CPC specimens, including a large number of holotypes and paratypes. One of the trilobites he discovered will be published shortly and is the largest in Australia and third largest in the world. An example of part of this trilobite, the pygidium, or tail, is on display in the fossil section of our foyer. Now we must remember, not all researchers look like mineralogists, paleontologists or geoscientists. The aim of the proposed Art of GA program is to raise awareness of our organisation and geoscience with those in the Australian community who may not usually engage with our work. This program contributes to Strategy 2028 it supports the principles of communicated science and strengthens our STEM engagement with the Australian community. Many of you might remember the amazing Italian jazz musicians who use geophysical data to create an amazing improv concert right here in this room, whilst others might remember uh, arguably our first artist in residence, Grayson Cook, uh, with his image in the top left there, who recently took out Australia's most prestigious natural science art prize, the Waterhouse with his uh, incorporation of Geoscience Australia satellite imagery. These are brilliant examples whereby interacting with new researchers or research groups can yield amazing rewards for not only the collection, organisation, or even the artists, but the many who may be fascinated or inspired as a result. This year, GA partnered with Craft ACT and ACT Parks and Conservation as a research partner to host a residency program with two award-winning artists. Valerie, who is a specialist in textiles and tapestry, and Harriet, who is a glass and other mixed media artist. Both have spent two weeks here at GA looking at the collection more broadly, as well as the geology and its relationship with Namaji National Park, where the rest of their residency has been. I can't wait to see what they produce. Later this year in August, we are looking forward to continuing our relationship with the ANU School of Art and Design, where we'll host a third year undergraduate class workshop here at GA with speakers from the National Gallery, potentially looking at pigments in paint. This will be followed by some other activities, including an art collection workshop during a science week in October, similar to the successful one that was run in 2018. And how cool are these banded iron formation tapestries from that exhibition? And yes, that is a sculpted perfect pyrite cube in the background. These are just a few of the many great examples of researchers utilising the collection. Here I aim to emphasise collection development and growth. Part of my role in the teams is to look for opportunities to improve the collection. And given the high dollar value placed on museum grade specimens, coupled with a limited amount of annual appropriation means that we need to look for savvy ways to approach acquisitions. We've applied for funding. Uh, we've gone, we've purchased at auction off, off wholesalers and even down at the local rock swaps. Donations, however, where the collection has made vast improvements through the goodwill and generosity of you all out there. I note that even our chief scientist has recently made a donation uh, from the world's largest zircon mine in South Australia. Thanks, Steve. Whether these donations come about as a result of colleagues, a formal or informal meeting with the team in person or out in the field, through a friend of a friend or network, a local association, or even through a chance occurrence, the collection is much better for it and ultimately the nation. The National Mineral and Fossil Collection is a registered deductible gift recipient, allowing tax-deductible donations to be made for those that might be sitting on the fence. 
We also aim to improve um, our geological time walk at the front uh, as well to enhance and make that a better experience. Now, in July 2016, two longtime fossicking friends, Paul McRae and John Miller, planned another one of their usual trips to metal detect up near Georgetown, Queensland. They had been fossicking for several weeks with not much luck when in the last few days of their visit, Paul got a strong signal from his detector. Now, for someone who hasn't been uh, metal detecting before, you th you'd think you'd be jumping up in the air. But my more rational brain, like Paul's on the day, was thinking, is this just another rusty old horseshoe or nail? He quickly called uh, John over and they began digging for a number of hours and uncovered, unbeknownst to them, something truly out of this world. After much deliberation, and contrary to their wives' opinions that it was just another black rock covered in red dirt, they did say it was okay for me to say that, <laughs> they had a feeling it was something special and it needed to be checked out. Having said that, Paul has admitted it spent about four weeks in the back of his ute after that. Interestingly, many years prior, John had visited GA to get some fossils identified by one of our team members and emeritus paleontologist, John Laurie. It was thanks to this kind of gesture that led both Paul and John to get a second opinion by bringing it here to GA. And, and this is even though they live literally miles away from Canberra. Now, we often get members of the public contacting us for advice on suspected meteorites, but it usually doesn't end well. In fact, almost always, I think this is probably the first for, for in my tenure. Uh, so the phone rang from Debbie at our reception saying, someone has a rock they would like to be looked at. As it was too heavy to, to bring into the building, I went out to the front car park where they opened their boot up and showed me this not so huge, but very heavy rock, which had the telltale signs of being a meteorite. And after John and Paul organized formal analysis and confirmation, it turns out that it was a really rare meteorite. I introduced to you the Georgetown Iron Meteorite, which the collection has acquired through an application for $200,000 funding by the Australian Government's National Cultural Heritage Account, which aims to protect significant Australian objects from being exported overseas. It is now on display here in our space section of the foyer gallery. It's the largest example discovered thus far, weighing close to 25 kilograms, eclipsing the second largest piece of 15 kilos held at the Queensland Museum. As it most likely broke apart in space, there are multiple pieces around the Georgetown area which have been found since 1988. And I know Paul and John only just left the other week to head back up there, albeit with brand new metal detectors, I'm told. <laughs> the asteroid belt is full of all sorts of mysterious meteoroids and asteroids, and this is no exception. Uh, you can see the extraordinary and very distinct pattern it makes, uh, which is so rare that it's easily distinguishable from others. Its internal structure also shows a preferred orientation or elongation, and under the microscope you can see complex intergrowths from what may have been the last phases of its growth um, as it uh, formed from an impact collision event. Studying these types of meteorites improves our understanding greatly of how planets like Earth formed from collisions and mergers between smaller bodies in the earliest days of the solar system. Having this meteorite available for research is the physical evidence of these special and unique conditions which operated then, but we weren't able to observe. There's still so much to learn from this meteorite, so through its acquisition and 330 gram offcut, researchers will be able to analyse it further to determine more important information. Certainly, I would love to know the terrestrial age of it, that is, how long ago did it fall to Earth, which can be done with isotope dating. I also want to highlight that we've created a fantastic online exhibit to tell the meteorite story and allow people to interact and learn about it digitally if they can't visit in person. It incorporates more spectacular images and video interviews, becoming quite a success and doubling our unique visitors to 4,000 for the first month after its release. I just wanted to show you now a quick snippet of one of the videos uh, from the online exhibition uh, where we posed the question to Paul and John, why they chose GA to be the meteorite's home. A lot more people can get a lot more out of it rather than cut it up into chips and uh, then you've got to go and market and sell them and 
that, but the aspect of getting it in here appealed to us that, um, well, the rest of Australia can see it if they want it. Uh, plus, we can bring our grandkids down there and say, Pop found that. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> they have brought their families in to visit since then, and um, they're always keen to hear any more um, research and science that comes out of it, too. Accessibility, awareness, and understanding are core to the principles of education and engagement. Being able to inspire someone for a fleeting moment, or perhaps a lifelong study of the geosciences, demonstrates the importance of collections. And we can utilise technology as well to improve this experience and understanding. I'll delve into some examples now. Last year, and thanks to an amazing array of ACT fossils in our collection, we embarked on a collaborative initiative to support a fossil emblem being chosen for the ACT. The ACT now joins three states in Australia with fossil emblems, and the public voted winner was a trilobite with the species name Batacara Michelai. Besides being totally cool, this activity increases awareness of the geosciences to a very broad audience, from rocks to fossils, the environment, past and present, deep time, whilst helping people better connect with their town and community. We had children voting, and many by choice, rather than being forced by their teacher or parents. Government departments pitted against each other, as a few of the candidates were from uh, the Parliamentary Triangle area. Scientists had their favourite. There was even a rumour that the winning fossil species was also discovered in a hip and trendy area of Canberra, Braddon, so to some it became hashtagged as the hipster trilobite. <laughs> <laughs> the inclusivity did not stop there. Uh, it did not just end there. We have some very talented GA staff who are also artists, and they produced five accompanying artworks to complement the displays. This artwork was then utilised as another engagement strategy as they were the basis for the colouring in competition that was run in conjunction with the winner being announced. With support from the Research School of Physics at the ANU and their lab, we have CT scans of all five candidates available online for schools and the public to download and 3D print their very own copy of the fossil emblem or perhaps their favourite one. Lastly, we developed an online exhibition with all the detailed paleontology and geology information of Canberra and the candidates. And did I mention that this was all run during the ACT election campaign, which was by accident, but it did invigorate the public and certainly the media's interest. The GA Library still has the physical exhibition display running, so please do visit if you haven't seen it already. Online content is certainly flavour of the month and a valuable resource. Together with our education team, uh, we created this video on an introduction to fossils where we go behind the scenes and visit the Commonwealth Paleontological Collection, discuss different types of body and trace fossils, learn how organisms may become fossilised, and some of the reasons why scientists study fossil specimens. This video was a great, engaging way to continue the learning journey for school children and the general public, particularly during the COVID lockdowns. Next on the cards will be a Space Rocks at GA video, so stay tuned. Last year, we were contacted by the Caroline Chisholm STEM Centre in Tuggeranong, asking if they could borrow material and have a display set up. This centre is one of only two in the ACT, and thousands of ACT school children and teachers visit these centres annually to learn more about STEM. Together with support, again, from the education team, we put together a fun, interesting and educational display for the centre based on the famous Minecraft game that incorporated scientific truths about the rocks and minerals in the game, as well as the real life use cases for the minerals. This display will help support those who visit to learn more about geology, the refinement of ores, to their application in modern day technology. It ties in with their curriculum based learnings as well as correcting the record on Minecraft fiction. <laughs> and yes, we have even put a display together in our very own minister's office, which I'm very proud of. A lot of thought does go into displaying material. In this case, there is a combination of minerals, rocks and fossils from every state and territory, with some added extra Queensland ones, like boulder opal from the minister's home state, which is also a favourite of mine. Some of the specimens are what we coin as critical minerals, ranging from graphite and lithium-rich spodumene to co cobalt-rich erythrite. And then, of course, there is how they are displayed, angles, lighting and labels. 
So a lot does go into any display we as a team are involved with. Whilst our formal tours and collection engagement activities have been on hold much of 2020, we have restarted group bookings and will recommence our famous experience tours along with other exciting initiatives later this year in October around Earth Science Week. One of those activities, and thanks to an inspiring ACT grant, we will be, we will be providing Australian Sign Language interpreted tours of the collection for the deaf community. It's important we all take steps to be more inclusive with a wide variety of communities and abilities. GA is also a member of the Australian Network on, Dis on Disability and supports accessible and inclusive environments. So now, whilst I have the floor, I, I might quickly, I'd like to quickly invite the deaf community in their own language, if I may, and apologies for those online as you won't be able to see me um, as I move to the front to do that. Thank you. Other recent public activities by our directorate more broadly, which hinge on the collection, include our advertisement in the Winter Holiday Happening School Holiday Booklet, uh, encouraging visitation to our public areas, which are normally much quieter then. This, coupled with a newly created digital collection treasure hunt for the foyer, which people can access with their smart devices via QR code, is a great addition by the education team, which links to key specimens out on the public display as well. Now, I love this quote. I believe even the Dalai Lama has used it. One of the most powerful ways for the public to engage with museums is not just as visitors, it's as volunteers. Here's why. The volunteer experience is direct and immediate. Volunteers spend extensive time within their chosen organisation, getting to know staff and visitors and seeing the positive impact of their efforts firsthand. They experience satisfaction of being part of that success and feel invested in the collection's mission. When you engage a volunteer, you engage a community member who feels like they belong. No contribution is too small and since the volunteer program first commenced in the collections team, we regularly have about a dozen or so remarkable individuals undertaking efforts to improve aspects of the collection. This is just a snapshot of some of our amazing current and former volunteers enjoying themselves. They are a diverse, talented, passionate bunch of people from all walks of life who I can't thank enough. We have emeritus staff, students from year 10 work experience to undergrads and those doing their doctorates, volunteers of all ages, demographics and abilities. They are dedicated and patient with their, with their tasks and projects. Some enjoy getting out and about, others have gone on to bigger and better things, whether that be work, study or retirement often to sunny Queensland where the Sunshine State unfortunately has at least two up on us as our two volunteers have uh, made their way up there. Some have landed work at GA, some have taken out categories in the annual ACT Volunteering Awards. We embrace diversity, equity and accessibility and inclusion. The GA collection provides an opportunity for them to contribute to their time and knowledge to the collection's legacy. They work on so many aspects of the collection and constantly improving it in intricate ways that I could spend a whole talk on that alone. I will have a focus on one now. I'd like to introduce you to one of our more recent projects, looking at our Legacy Bureau of Mineral Resources sample submission forms. They relate to the sampling or creation of our thin section slide collection and come in various forms of hard copy from books to individual pieces of paper. We have digitised close to 30,000 of these, which is the majority of forms that we are aware of that exist to kickstart the project. These forms have quite a bit of very important metadata from the year the project the sample was acquired from, dating back as far as the 1950s. They also contain vital locality information, geological province names in many cases, rock names and other detailed petrological information. Subsequent to scanning, 
We've also renamed all the digital files to correlate to the sample numbers, a huge undertaking by the team. In the beginning of 2020, we embarked on uploading the 30,000 scanned cards to the Digivol digital volunteer platform. For those not familiar with Digivol, organisations, mainly museums, upload difficult and tedious tasks, often transcription ones like ours, and members of the public can log in from anywhere in the world and the comfort of their own home to perform volunteering tasks. Our research support team in the library has also made use of this technology in the past with their Antarctic and now PNG field notebook transcription projects. In terms of the BMR forms, we have had over 380 digital volunteers transcribe our 30,000 cards in the last 18 months, which is an amazing achievement by any measure. And I thank all those people involved in, that project, in this project. Once transcribed, the platform offers a QC option, which is where we are currently up to with the records. Once QC'd, we aim to upload this data into our thin section slide database. Uh, however, this project will have another huge benefit to other GA physical collections, whether that be the GA repository section's 500,000 rock samples or our laboratories who manage the information after processing samples for analysis. The reason is this, these sample submission forms are not only the record of the thin sections, they also relate to the parent specimen stored in the GA rock store. They also relate to the sampling and analysis done by the laboratories over the past 70 years. So this transcription project will provide locality and critical geological metadata for much of these other collections as well. I wanted to highlight a new capability, particularly to internal staff who may not be aware. The collections team may have expertise and equipment that could be of use as part of your work. Our volunteer workspace room adjacent to the library is available to all staff, volunteers and escorted visitors. In there is a photography station with cameras and lighting, should you need to get a better image of something. We also have a petrographic microscope with camera for viewing and imaging rock thin sections. There is a gemological uh, equipment like polariscopes, uh, UV lamp, box, as well as a gemological microscope with camera. Should that be of use to others? There are PCs and monitors available for registered volunteers and GA staff, as well as a flatbed scanner that can digitise 35 mil and glass slides. You can get in touch with the team uh, to learn more. The collections team also regularly provides advice. This can range from the public through to journalists and other media representatives to government. Just a few recent examples include Department Prime Minister and Cabinet, where we provided information on opals and the geology of Australia for a promotional activity they were compiling last year. We visited the Snowy Hydro Centre in Cooma late last year at their request to review and discuss displays, particularly for their geological material. Other cultural institutions like the National Museum of Australia, where we are reviewing text for their new gallery development, we also recently answered some questions for the Perth Mint around Australia's largest reef silver specimens and gold from the Father's Day vein at the Beta Hunt gold mine. We also created this product, which is available online to help members of the public review their specimen finds, particularly in relation to determining if it's a meteorite. You can imagine since acquiring the Georgetown, suspected meteorite queries have also increased exponentially. In wrapping up, we facilitate and support new scientific discoveries based on the collection. We educate and inspire at whichever opportunity we can through a variety of channels. We fulfil our role as custodian of the nation's and Commonwealth geoscience collection for the benefit of all and always keep an eye out for a gem in the rough as this single green anglocyte on the right depicts so elegantly. To the future, we are, an we are at an exciting crossroad where we have just signed off on implementing a new dedicated museum database to manage the collection. All of our images, loans, donations, exhibitions and scientific results. And the thing I am most excited about is an online module which will mean all of our data is accessible to everyone. Ultimately, supporting our mission of maintaining, preserving and sharing this amazing collection which belongs to all of us. We look forward to collaborating more with internal scientists and our high priority programs like Exploring for the Future, as well as continuing to increase focus on space and particularly on improving representative Australian critical minerals in the collection. And lastly, support the public spaces engagement strategy implementation plan, 
which will be conducting changes on the look and feel of our public areas into the future. Before finishing, I want to say a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart to my team, colleagues and friends and all those amazing people who have left a legacy with the collection and contributed in any way, whether small or large, from volunteers to donors, right through to past curators and the originals in 1927. Your con contribution is deeply valued, enduring and will improve our understanding and no doubt enrich the lives of those who interact with the collection into the future. I hope you enjoyed this journey into the collection and update on some of the projects we've been working on. Some links to all the online exhibitions I mentioned can be found here. Thank you for listening and giving me your precious time today.